Hey, welcome back to the Drawing Database. This is Mark Leone here. So, uh, this is this lesson is a additive subtractive drawing of a head study uh, in the <clears throat> in Photoshop in uh, using the um, little tiny uh, Wacom tablet, not the Cintiq, but the little little tiny ones that you don't draw on the screen. And those those are a particular challenge because you can't actually draw right on the surface that you're looking at so your eye and your hand as you as you probably well know a lot of you you've done this or you may have one it takes a little adjusting and so I did a demo of this drawing of our model here at the University of Bryan this has been a couple years ago and I did it as a test and I didn't do any sound it was before I really knew anything about recording or had the, the equipment yet um, but I had the the idea of the database and so it was just a test to get started before I, I was waiting for good camera equipment and so I didn't have any sound because the sound was was bad and so I thought well I've got it I might as well now that I know how to overdub I'll just overdub it so I'll walk you through this it's about an hour and 48 minute drawing and um, I'll try not to put you completely to sleep uh, if you want to go through the entire process so I think of the drawing as additive subtractive completely additive subtractive so the first thing I did was after selecting the size I wanted and I just think of a white piece of paper and I'm not using any fancy brush <clears throat> excuse me fancy brushes I generally now like to use Kyle brushes when or now it's the Adobe Creative Suite that he's connected to but this was just what was in Photoshop I think 2B pencil so anyway I'm taking additive subtractive processes in normal you know kind of drawing and working thinking about this background tone of what I'm doing giving a little bit of additive uh, drawing and subtractive a drawing erasing and scratching back and so that's what all of this is uh, so far so just moving moving the drawing tool and now the erasing tool back to get a surface that's not so uh, pristine and so clean uh, to the to the drawing surface that I can actually uh, work on it with a little bit more of a um, kind of honed or lived in I guess surface a little bit but certainly if you know anything if you're just new or if this is you know an advanced technique you've probably done added and subtracted before so getting a little bit of surface value modulation to the the drawing project so the image I chose of Brian, we did a whole photo shoot with him one, one uh, fall break with a, stu a photographer student of ours. Wonderful, wonderful student. And uh, Brian did a, a ton of poses and we focused in on the head and then we, um, he had some candy and we all had some candy. I said it would be perfect to, to don't show us you're chewing on it, but use it to like do some things with, with candy and keep your mouth closed, but try to force some expressions um, with something in your mouth and uh, he, we, he came up with this one and a lot of others you can see some of them on the the databases uh, photo reference section but then so we chose this one and then after a while um, there were other other sites you know, on YouTube etc that had really great photo model reference of so many wonderful varied models that I stopped I thought well we really don't even we don't even need any more since uh, an area like Croquis Cafe has a great, great um, uh, model base to choose from, and they keep adding to it. So I always promote them. I don't get any money from them, but uh, they they're wonderful. So that's that's kind of what's going, what's going on with models. And then you can see here I'm I'm continuing to work the surface. There's a lot of time spent here. It may seem like. You may ask the question, okay, why? But I'm just trying to get a feel for the surface and, and make it look really, tr as much as I can with pixels to look like more like an additive, you know, subtractive drawing surface background. So now I'm just about ready to get the lay-in started. So I'm moving to a smaller tip here and I fast forward a little bit to the finish. This is just kind of where I ended up with the background tone um, it can be very different for other people it could be darker or lighter and I you know might settle on something different next time but I felt like it was ready to, to push on to the the actual now sketching so now laying of the structure of the head working with a a uh, smaller nib or tip 
about 10 uh, in terms of the width, and then about 23 or so percent of opacity. So not 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 particularly dark. Uh, it can feel like graphite or maybe medium charcoal here. Just getting a light lay-in of the form. So he's tilted to the to rind in our view and push back just a little bit. So finishing out the neck here, getting a feel for that. And the shoulder now back back between that area. <clears throat> so getting the rough general lay-in of curvature of the neck, the cylindrical quality of that. So this will be a full value study and you know, kind of a hatching sort of semi-cross hatching technique with some a little bit broader strokes for value to as, as well. A little bit more stylistic, a little bit more energetic than uh, something things I've done earlier that are a little bit more academic and a little staid. So I try not to talk too much about style um, in these instructional videos until maybe it's really relevant later on. So now the here I'm defining the side plane of the head, the zygomatic arch and the temporalis arch at top there where the cursor is to get a sense of where his form turns back to 90 degrees in the head, back of the head there. That's very important. I tell my students very quickly, bring the head and neck down together quickly, find the side plane, and then start locating your landmarks. So now the landmarks are coming in. <clears throat> hairline a little bit and through there the top of the cranium curved over finding that center line soon of the form really tilted over look at the angle of the eyes the angle of the nose and the mouth they're all arched up higher so the left edge is much higher than the right edge and that's because of perspective we're slightly three-quarter we're looking slightly just slightly below in our viewpoint. So getting that arch of the, the eye line there, roughly the center of the eye, and you'll see me vacillate, bounce back and forth through other areas. Into the jaw, into the mandible, a little bit of the muscle, sternocleidomastoid coming down there. <clears throat> and just filling in a little tone already when I can to give a little blocky look to the head to define those planes a little bit further. A bit more side plane and then the brow area coming across and over. I kind of encapsulate the eyes. It's the top of the brow to get those eyebrows sitting and resting on top. And you have many different expressions. He's a little bit more open and of course he's also looking up so we have a close-up of We'll get to a close-up of some of the eyes and the pupil and iris will be looking looking up above. And downward now, a little, little indication of the hair. <clears throat> Outward cell, that can all change. Pretty light line. You know, since it's really in the this particular digital drawing process the pressure point right now does matter some but the opacity part of it is is also important so getting that smaller tip and then also a lighter handle uh, on, on opacity helps as well so yeah, feeling the cheek and the jaw and that shadowed area you can see I tone that back a little push that back further I'm just kind of building towards that middle jawbone there masseter muscle coming across here I'm finding the bottom of the nose so where the nostrils end and the, the bulb tip of the nose the septal area curves in <clears throat> that little area and it's on a nice angle there that's important so we get in a little closer so we can see this better <clears throat> side plane brow coming down center line here it flattens there by the the brow. Let running through that area it flattens a little bit and then it kind of bulges outward. That little line there is important, that little glabella center. It's the center line of the head. Notice I don't draw a real strong center line. So when I draw for myself, I don't 
necessarily draw those heavier landmark lines. It's not because I don't visualize them, because I can see them in my mind and don't have to always draw them. I would suggest until you get to a point where you're really confident and have got some experience, always draw them out. Sometimes I always do, and I certainly do for my students, almost always. Here it's a little bit more advanced. It's got a little, little bit more style rather than an academic. It's got more of a scratchier uh, gestural kind of look to it at the end of the day. So nostril, bulb coming out, thinking about a boxy form, and then a cylindrical form, and then an egg form ultimately for these nostrils too as well, so I indicate them. So I'm just kind of randomly, but with care, beginning to flesh out the forms, getting the philtrum to come down. Look how far the nose bulges out to touch the end of the brow arch there, close to that. So most of that far eye is covered up, isn't it, by the brow. It's very much starting out with a box and then it becomes a cylinder as it curls on over further down to the filtrum that curls a little bit and then finding the center of the lip, the upper lip. Feeling that zygomatic arch, that cheekbone, if you will, in through there. And then bringing it over now, finding the other side. Try to get one side to the other. Finding it over. <clears throat> bringing it across. And down that little curve indicates where the maxilla is, and then that's even stronger indication where that shadow is of his jaw. And this curls up. You can see where it curls up from the jaw up a little bit through that area. So getting that feeling of all this is rounded, ultimately. <clears throat> Extension of the muscle forms there, of the five pulleys that attach to or zygomatic arch area to the orbicularosaurus area, area. So rounded through and then the lip now it's puckered and tightened up so we're getting the feel of the gesture of it coming through the overlap of the top lip down a little bit more of the node and the gathering and you know you draw what you see and you try to relate to what it what it looks like structurally, if it's a ball or a box or if it's a cylinder, and then you draw the gesture of what you're seeing too as well and finding that rhythm. So notice I kind of vacillate downward and then I'll come over and, and uh, see another area that starts to need a little bit of correction or change. Getting that chin, jaw region, and I come back to the lip, finding the center there where it hits the philtrum, and very much push down. And this lip wants to curl up and then under. So there's the center part and it's got a little bit of a bulb tip to it, that, that front part. And through there. There we go. And curving around and then getting the inflation of, he's got a little piece of candy, hard candy in his mouth, kind of holding on to it and it gives you this interesting look, like a fullness to the jaw. Getting the actual bony part, the not excuse me, the actual uh, mental labial group of muscles flexed too as well. You can see how they really stretch and they curl up to get the the lips to purse. A little cross hatching there. I don't. I personally don't like to cross hatch as much unless I get into deep shadow. And I'll explain more about that why later as we go on. We have that, see the ultimate block in here. Well, I'll explain it now. And the reason why is it tends to erode the flow and direction of mark making. And so when you crosshatch, you tend to lattice over. Um, so one direction in a kind of a 90 degree direction difference, and it's hard to get the D, the flow continuous. And so only in areas where there's deep dark will I probably crosshatch that get kind of buried by so many lines. Somebody did crosshatching to, you know, masterful results was, was Rembrandt in his etchings. Also Goya, both of them, two, two of my favorite artists in terms of their graphic production as well. Not, not only their paintings, but 
some of my favorite works are their graphic productions. So, so if you haven't seen their work before, I highly uh, would recommend going to going seeing Goya's works, look him up, research him, and also Rembrandt. And then I was very fortunate when I was in Madrid, the last time I was in Madrid, to see a little museum. I forget the name of it, but it housed the uh, etching plates for Goya's Disasters of War series, as well as the Los Caprichos, um, and it was just the plates in a darkened room, and you got to see them, um, the the uh, the plates that still exist, and it was wonderful to see those in all their glory. So cross hatching and hatching. So now coming back, just defining through the lip, you can see the bone structure, the head coming through here, and getting things located <clears throat> further defining a few indentations or bumps and trying to relate them to the structure. And you're going to see soon here I'll block in the rest of this with value in terms of just a hatch mark. So there I go. You can anticipate. This is all overdubbed. So I'm reviewing this. This is about two years ago from when I did it actually. So from the time I'm overdubbing it to the time I'm actually uh, narrating the drawing if you will. If anybody watches this, who knows? So curvature underneath the jaw where the digastric muscles end, that, that area beyond the chin before the neck muscles come down, that digastric area. It's kind of a triangle for the most part. Here it looks just more a little bit more blunt, like a rectangle. <clears throat> So here just solidly working through, and you can see where now the background tone becomes uh, more muted. We don't see it as much now, and it just becomes a, an atmospheric quality, and I can change all that later on. Now, so now it looks like it's time to go into the eye, moving this over. You can see this better. And you can see the structure of the eyes, the, the, uh, the orbits of the eye, the sockets. They look like, you know... Uh, uh, rudimentary sunglasses and then the zygomatic arch goes back to the head so it is kind of a, a play on the orbits getting that defining that brow through coming on down further top of the head now I'm concerned a little bit about contour line and weight, line weight. We know, do you know where the light source is coming from? It's coming from the top right in front of the model somewhat. Our wonderful photographer Crystal and Hackett who, who, who made these photographs for us. It's been about two years ago now. She's great. One of our great photo, photo majors here at the university. She was a great kid. He is a great kid. Coming down and now defining the nose brow. Notice how his nose in this view from after the nasal on the bony part, the cartilage really turns and buckles underneath. And it's, it becomes more of a tube now working contouring across it. So a contour line and then also a, 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 a darker, thicker, richer line where I need that to, to, to be fulfilled. And see, then I'm turning the nose down, getting a little bit of the nostril opening to open up for me in the septal area of the nose on the outer edge. And it's coming down, curling around. You can see I start to put a little bit more pressure to make it a little bit darker. I'll tell you this, it was a challenge working with that little bitty tablet, only because I'm not actually touching the string, string uh, screen. Excuse me. So. Yeah, those of you that have used this, you know that that difference between uh, looking where you're drawing with that cursor is, and then having the pad where you draw, you don't see it. It's really a weird little take. But then later on, you just you kind of figure it out and you get it. But then when you can get a hold of a of a Cintiq, the Wacom Cintiq, it makes drawing a very naturalized kind of process. It makes it even. Yeah, just really natural and, and congruent and, and easy. So the nostril is very open now, so I get the, the base of the nostril flare. Notice I didn't go too dark there. It's pretty dark in that cavity, but 
Um, we because the photograph's a little contrasty, you have to be careful. You don't want to go too dark in there too quick. It's pretty shallow, beyond. and then it goes up a very very narrow opening up to the the nasal cavity and on into up the upper shaft of the nose. So most of that's just cast shadow because of the shaft of the nose going over. So the nose is getting clearer as we come down the cheek now over that and then we get overlapped there right there where I'm drawing by the mouth uh, muzzle the maxilla part through there defining more the nostril and underneath that little bulgy curve where it's highlighted downward plane now that kind of that reddish area in shadow of the side plane of the nose and the top of the zygomatic arch so coming down the brow the eyebrow that's curling back over now into the wanting to get us into the socket and so I start to feel the eye now watch here as I'm placing what I'm thinking is the most of an eyeball generally and also the lash and the eyelids kind of a little together at all the same time and notice we don't see much here you got to be careful here the tendency is to show too much and that's kind of the outer part and you can see where the pupil and the iris just emerge a little there and I'll clean that up a little later so it's all about getting many different passes of your of your drawing and or your painting in, in a just more traditional sense of the word of the, of the structure I suppose and bringing down the filtrum a little further defining that that outer curved edge it's like a cylinder curving over and then underneath this goes this goes under so it kind of goes in straight you can see me feel that and then I'll probably make some cur well, curved underlines it's yeah the outside of that and the insides just the opposite but the value will take care of that so overlapping there the outer edge of the lip very pursed and brought in so the muscles are in contraction and flex in there bringing the mouth muscles to a a uh, uh, area rising up <clears throat> really the bottom of the the, the muscles in the, the uh, chin area the mentolabial group and the depressor anguli oris is really working hard slight to the side of the chin there the node that little darker area I'm drawing comes out moving down a little bit and so be, being also aware that every time I make a mark, I'm also very fast thinking about direction and flow of the form and what's the best way I can kind of scrape across it and make a mark that is in direction to a downward trend or a sideways trend. And that took a little time to get comfortable with over the course of my training when I was a you know, young student. And, continuing to practice these, this craft of, of uh, drawing. So you can see I'm curling the lip around like a, like a sausage that's curled up or something that's elastic and flexible here and then curled through, curled, curled, curled around like so. It curls through here and then really curling underneath so it's a very short space for all that to curl that lip curls back into itself back into itself down and through here there we go and then we get this overlap that node area where you get that little interesting little flap see that and that's gives you that smirky kind of look it's just the the muscle stretching and pulling upwards to feel that pull and you see those two lines down below it help with the rhythm of that too as well I'm getting the bottom of the lip so I'm defining but I'm not I'm not making a final pass at the definition of the of the mouth forms and they're they're sketched in loosely and will become clear even in a looser technique a little a little further over over time outer edge that bulky kind of quality that says I've got something in my mouth there we go 
are coming downward. And getting a little downward trend of the furrowed area of the spot below the chin where the teeth rest. And there's, of course, there's skin and flesh. That area is generally flatter, but it's very much in stress. There's kind of little bulky, little tubular like depressions and raises that show stress and ra uh, areas being raised up. And then, of course, down to the chin which kind of like two ovals together. Those cheek muscles, the chin muscles there I'm working on and against the bonier part that make two kind of flat shapes. And then our, jo our job is to make it rounder and give it 3D expression as well. So I mean you could draw this one along with me if you want or you could just if you're interested to watch you know, a demonstration and get some thinking behind, you know, what I'm doing. That's part of the purpose of all this is to give you some more thinking and more definitions and uh, demo time to see things. You know, when I was a student, we were really, really engaged. Not all of us, but, but most of us that were very serious and would have our professors demo for us. And I've had students ask me privately to demo. You know, come back to my studio office and I'll draw for them and they'll watch. And then others, you know, were really engaged about demos, uh, you know, in the classroom. But we were we were very much, as students in Los Angeles, very, very, very engaged with that. We wanted to see a lot. And, and um, we were fortunate to have many professors that obliged. And, and part of it was the class structure. We had eight-hour classes a day. And they were five classes per week, and each class was once a week, and it was eight hours. And so that's a long time just to sit there and teach if you're the professor or the artist. So they drew along with us or painted a lot along with us, too. So that became really a mentoring, you know, physical activity right in the class. It was wonderful. So defining further facial bone structure, muscle structure form, pulling out a little bit so we can see how that's going too as well. That's one of the difficult things about working digitally, at least for me, and I don't, I don't work it that often, so others are probably faster. But it's the idea of pulling out and then pulling back in when you need to work detail and kind of seeing it uh, all together can be a little bit challenging. And that's a little bit more unusual than um, than than um, than kind of just working, you know, you know, normally where you just kind of kind of pull your head back. Here you have to do it manually further. <clears throat> so everything is blocked in. I just need to get the the. Uh, his right eye, our left eye in our view, kind of laid in more cleanly and clearly to get uh, a finished kind of what I would call just a, uh, a quicker lay-in. took about, what, 20, 20 or 30, maybe 20 minutes or so to get that completed. So I'm feeling that out. The next step has got to be that pretty soon. You'll see me hit that pretty quickly. Getting that cheek a little bit further. Now I'm ready, looks like, hopefully, so you can see that. Pulling that down, and now we're ready to pull into that eye. So like I was talking about. So here, I, you know, I want to pull in pretty deep to see that structure. So the first thing, first and foremost, I'm thinking about structure. And that is the eye is pulled back into the socket, and it's also separated by bone and plane from the nose so it doesn't jam all the way into the nose there's a space in between there and so get the brow downturned a little bit further and I, I like right already off the off the bat where the little structure is showing of the eye the left eye not the one I'm drawing now where it's kind of set in that feels already pretty good sometimes it feels good sometimes it, it's not I've got to go back and 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 change it also like the the relative down the downward position 
how the right one is is pushed greater and further further away from us certainly because of the nose in in the way there and structurally so just gesturally getting that in to feel that through touching up the nostril here and one day here I'll get to the other eye like I'm waiting in anticipation of that and getting a little bit of the inner part of the nostril very up very much upturned towards us but it's not a flat circle a lot of students will beginners will draw that as a kind of a circle and you you'll never see the nostril as a circle so you have to really really pay attention the outer edge of the nose there a little bit of that cast shadow laying on to the cheek the inner cheek area shows you that's just a little separated. The nostril attaches to the cheek there, but it's a little separated and through there. There we go. Okay, well, am I ready to go to the eye? I think I'm ready. All right, well, yeah, here I go, finally. Looks like I procrastinated, but uh, I need wanted to see these other things in. All right, so coming up the brow. This is the bone area right in through here. That's actually bone and skin and skin wrapped over the bone. So that little area tells me the very highest part of that eye structure. And you're getting a little bit of the brow coming through here. There we go, and down. That's it, and through there. There we go. And on through. Getting that rhythm of the brow even further. Pretty bushy, bushy brows. And taking a look at that, pulling back, seeing how that's working. It's working decently well. Lots of adjusting could happen later on. He's a little, I've drawn him a little wider than, than um, what he can be. He's a little bit more narrower. I've drawn him a little bit wider, if you noticed. I'm okay with a little bit of change, as long as it doesn't take away from the overall expression or look. We wind up with the final image looking like the model. I'm okay with a little bit of change. So the eye now. So stretching to the the lid. Like I'm going to make this a little broader. Or narrower. Getting that lid and look at really will curve up here. Right around into the tear duct region in the, there and then cascades downward. Curving across there, up to, but still giving a little space with the end of the, the uh, bony part of the brow is the uh, socket top. And coming over with the lid, feeling that curve, and then it cascades really far down. It's on top of that ball, and then really shoots down there and into, into the fold there. And I'll put a little tone on it, get that a little cleaner. Down to the tear duct and a little bit will go lower too. And the bottom lid, it curves over because we're looking underneath it. Normally it would co come under it in a straight view, but here it curves, curves over a little bit just slightly because of the perspective so the curve can change in perspective <clears throat> like so then filling in the rest of the ball that's actually the ball now with skin over it the lid and then that end of that dark on the left to that lighter area is the the bone so that that's all here running through there that's all bone now with that dark that dark ends and the light begins that's the last part of the cavity of the socket so the the eyeball sits in the socket but there's room for for muscle and for skin and in other material whatever that would be tendon i was supposed to as well attaching muscle to the eyeball and then we curve underneath there with the folds of the skin and then more 3D structure coming through and over. Curls back. Starts to curl and under curl here and over. There we go. 
Getting a little bit more definitive plane, that side plane of the nose now that pulls back from the nasion, the bony structure in front that's not cartilage but hard, but there's a space between that area and the eye. So we need to make sure we have plenty of room in between there and just getting some contouring through here. There we go. That's, that cheek right there is probably a little high. I don't know if I correct it or not. It's a little high from the folds of the of the eye you can see from the photo, but it's not disturbing enough to where I guess I thought I needed to change it. So it is a little bit uh, too, too high. I could come down a little bit. So more definition around in the socket and brow area. Getting a little, little more cleaner with it, getting the outer tur curvature as it kind of turns in and falls into the socket. The socket's kind of like a black hole. Everything wants to curve into it because it's such an opening, an opened area. <clears throat> with this deep, deep cavity where the ball fits through. It's a very conical box-like in the beginning and it gets more conical as it goes back into our, our skull. More slide of the lid there. Brow. Turning in. There we go, feeling that through it through here, around the nose further. Over to the nostril, continuing on with the nostril, the back behind the nostril, cast shadow, the light source is to the right. It's a little bit of cast in through there. Curvature over the nose. I guess I'm gonna wait on the pupil and iris for a while. Cascading over that. That's where the highlight is. Later on, I'll erase all that out. Like a good subtractive, additive, subtractive drawing. If you're not sure what that means, additive is when you draw with the with the lead or the material you're drawing with charcoal or whatever it is. Could be Conte crayon or pastel or color pencil or ink. And then subtractive is when you can draw while erasing, and that be done mostly with obviously erasers. So additive, subtractive, bringing out subtractive light. Unless you're working on darker paper, then if you erase that, it brings out the dark. So you can just flip that process around. But most of the time, traditionally, it's it's um, adding media is additive. And then when you subtract media by erasing, it's a drawing, making marks. It's it's subtractive. So pretty pretty easy to remember additive, subtractive. So there we go. So a little bit more definition now on the nose through here and I think I'm sub actually subtracting out just to bring out that so I'm taking the eraser tool and then getting more opacity and uh, making it stronger and just erase out the beginning tips of that those highlights on the nose and through there and the septal division is pretty strong and because the light is coming from the right both those septal tips will be in a little bit of highlight and later on the the one to closest to us or the left higher and left is a little bit bigger and brighter so you can see me start to get a little feel for the light through there. And so for some reason I'm leaving the pupil and iris out on the uh, bigger eye, but we'll, we'll get there, I promise. So that was a little subtractive area. Now I go back to the eye. It looks like, it's interesting to analyze your own motives. So it looks like, it's like okay, I know it's a hard area with the eye and I, I want to go here and go on a journey and then I come back to it. And, I think probably what I'm also telling myself is that I need a little bit more information around it to make sure it's a good eye. So, I, you know, for a lot of t a lot of things, uh, a lot of drawings I do when I draw traditionally, I'll wait in include the eye la the eyes last. I usually start with the nose and work my way down, and the eyes are relatively last. So now putting on the pupil and the iris. So he's looking up a little bit. Part of the iris is covered. Uh, by the lower lid just slightly so indicate that I also look for the whites the width of the whites of the eyes a little bit to help me out then I'll just brush over everything 
with a value because I can always I can always subtract out the highlight later and then get the the pupil in there that darker aperture where light is uh, coming through so it's an opening through the the iris there and the, the pupil and of course the cornea goes on top of it and then I'll probably add a little quick highlight in just a moment just to get the very basics of the eye structure. And generally highlights on the eye in that area are very glossy and they're very hard edged and very light. Generally uh, highlights on the eye are some of the lightest values in a composition in terms of a highlight, the ultimate kind of kind of highlight. So I laid the structure in pretty well. It's a good pass. I still feel that cheekbone that that uh, where the redder part ends is a little high. There seems seems to be more of the eyelid wrinkling and underneath. I don't I don't know if I ever change it. That that's one thing. If I had to go back, I'd change just a little bit. But it's not a major thing. Sometimes I'll let little incorrections stand if 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 I can live with them. And I, I know it doesn't really affect much for the drawing, if I'm working from a model, if I'm working from a reference photo. And of course if you're working out of your head it won't matter because you don't have a reference point. But a lot of times I'll just live with something. And a lot of times, you know, if you're making a more expressive drawing, the more mistakes or strange errors you, you welcome them for expressive emotional, you know, kind of content. So it's looking pretty good there in terms of the overall just structure of everything put together and perspective and where I've got the the eye area located a little darker in through there, some little darker opacity through here. So now I'm gonna go back to the eraser tool and looks like I'm probably gonna put on a little streak of a highlight, a little dot. There, and I kind of make a downward mark. I pull and drag it just a little bit because it's a downward. It's like one little nice brush stroke kind of downward. So it pulls down a little bit through there. So it works pretty well, I think, getting a little bit of the light side of the eyeball there. So it works pretty well. Also, I've got him looking up, which is important. And so the eye position is correct. And now I'm just doing a little subtractive drawing in that area. of the lid to make that work and that could that could change There's a lot more to do and just kind of cleaning it up and then soon we'll be going for some deeper passes of value all over the all over the head to really start to make this image really come alive in terms of getting more more finish so probably about a little past a third not quite halfway there to, to the final ending product that I wind up with. A little bit more of the brow, the eyebrow and the value that it starts to create. And you notice now I'm making these lighter lines and I'm layering them so it starts to build up dark. Now I'm going to, I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to go to a more, a much, much larger, uh, broader section. That could be like a charcoal stick as well because that will take, if I just use this light, uh, excuse me, thinner line, that will take quite a lot longer. It's almost, it'd be almost like an etching. and I wanted to um, create something uh, a little quicker. It's like an hour and 45 minutes tops, which is pretty fast. It's still still in the sketch phase. You know, people ask me a lot in, through my students or on YouTube, YouTube land, about time, how long did it take you to do that, and you're so fast, or others are slower. It really doesn't matter. What really matters is the the final the final product ultimately. I've, I've worked on drawings. I've seen students work on drawings for a long time and they didn't turn out so well. And I've worked on drawings for, for a minimum amount of time and had students do the same thing and they worked out beautifully, remarkably. And so time is, is of uh, less important as you think. I, I know this, if you're drawing academically and you're doing that 
exclusively. The more you do and get more experience, the more you certainly will uh, get faster at the at the drawing process. It will go very, very quickly as you combine your experience with your hand and speed will be it will be a non factor. It will just happen. So you don't you don't have to draw fast. It's not it's not a requisite. So adding more hatched lines through the process here, getting down to the neck and further, and I'll be soon ready now to go to a broader, a much broader uh, width here. Let's see. So from nine to starting with 23, and then, and then it's going to be too small. And so I'm just judging, and that looks maybe that's going to be. I kind of give it a test here to see if I like it or not. In the opacity is only 20, about 22 percent. So it's kind of like working with the side of the charcoal pencil to now block in the shadows. I'm not trying to get every value as I see it. What I'm trying to do is to get the separate the planes of the head now a little further from from where they were before. Bone structure and think I'm gonna go wider. It looks like now I got to 72. Yeah, that feels better. <clears throat> so this is very broad, so I can block all this in quite quickly. Because I can layer this quite a bit. And notice I'm building up the drawing, working the shadows, but I'm I'm not going too dark too quick. I'm not interested in getting the exact value on my first pass. What I'm more interested in is getting the light to illuminate and to come out as I work the image slowly but uh, surely here. That's important to see. So I know I'm going to take, I already know I'm going to take several passes to fulfill and finish, finish the image. side of the bottom of the neck thinking about rhythm and structure and, and stroke of the of the, um, the pencil pushing it down we're working around a little bit of the ear so I don't block out the ear I could draw over the ear and just erase out that might have been easier but I try to be, take a little bit more care here so we're starting to emerge now, as we can see, from the murkiness and the generality to getting a little bit more specific. There we go. Just working it all over. Building up the value. Building up the marks. Trying to cut into the shape of that cheekbone as it underturns and gets into that underturn of the maxilla and feeling kind of where the core shadows are generally going to start now. Darkest parts of the shadows, kind of mapping them out a little bit further. And then blocking that, and that'll be all be dark later. What I don't do is I don't get too dark too quick. And re rethinking my shoulder position there. So that thicker, broader line was is probably where I'll reposition the shoulder it needs to go up. Putting a little tone in the nostril here. <clears throat> here I'm just beginning to get 
kind of psyched up for the bigger movement of the building these darks up. So the trick is to build these darks through, but then uh, relate structure. Make sure you hold on to the structure of the side plane of the head. And then, of course, we'll have time to really get in and, and work with some of the detail of the, of the hair. But we don't want to get there too quickly. We want to build this up. within a reasonable amount of time. So cheekbone structure, turning that cheek, turning the volume at, uh, that ultimately it underturns and cuts up underneath and meets up with the maxilla. So it's very, can be very high and hollow. And underneath there you can kind of, if you push your fingers up against your cheekbones where it really gets hollow and underneath there, that's, that's a open area you could stick your finger, finger through there. So now building the width out further. And it's going to go slowly now in terms of definition. And I'm being careful with, with it for the most part. So I'm subtracting even right now just to get a little bit of that cheek structure down by the chin to work out, taking off a little bit of the brow. Looks like it's a little bushy. Let's see how far I take off later on. I'm not afraid to take that off. Back of the head a little bit just to clean it up somewhat further. cleaning up that edge and I can go back and later on and make it more believe uh, completely you know more nuanced than what it is for now and going back now opaquely feeling the value of the cheekbone and and what will be the jaw in a minute feeling a little bit of that dark getting those core shadows further downward feeling down the jaw Getting the feeling of that contour to flow for me. So they very much kind of come together. Underneath the ear. See how general it still is? Very, still very loose. Now underneath. With the shadow for the what the jaw makes the shadow. And this becomes the core shadow, the darkest part of what I, where I can see of the shadow. It already starts to give it volume. I, I, now adding those darks here really starts to pop out the, the, excuse me, the image and give it further definition. Of course, we'll go darker, but it's the, the beginning pass of those core shadows that really start to separate it now further. And you can see the image emerging cleaning that edge up. It's always in a state of progress of cleaning edges, of working edges, and the edge on the outside is a harder edge. Coming in there a little tighter now. Let's see what I do here. Okay, back to additive drawing. We're going to go smaller now. I'm going to clean up the mouth. Looks like I need to start cleaning all this out a little bit further before I get into the full dark side of the head effect as well. I could have done that, continue to do that. It's interesting to see the process now about two years removed from when I did it and narrate it a little bit and give you what I think I was thinking um, back 
uh, two years ago, which is with a very what was with is a very more difficult tool to create with than rather the Cintiq because you're drawing a little bit blind because you can't see where the actual pen tip in your hand. You don't look at your hand, you look at the screen and you're drawing without your hand and the screen together so that it's a little, it's awkward, it's, but it's interesting too as well. Tip of the lip there, there's that little furrowed underneath white line of the of the top of the lip where the, where the skin gets a little lighter. Lips are more blood red for, for most all of us because they have less skin layers and more capillaries there so they're very sensitive to weather and to being ch chaffed and they're also more uh, sensitive to erogenous kissing etc as you, as you understand that and so that that's why they get redder as we see more blood capillaries so they take on a more a more um, redder look in, in most most cultures or darker depending on your culture or your ethnicity curving down curving across that form these little lines mean something in that every stroke I'm making every single one believe it or not I'm thinking about perspective and direction and where am I at on the model in terms of uh, what position I need to be in and where I need to make a mark moving from left to right or top to bottom or right to left and so so as to define the form a little cleaner and a little clearer coming around it's a ball form or a box form so you can see the lips are coming along nicely they look a little now overdrawn compared to the rest of the drawing but that will that will change once I build up further dark so those hatch lines digging into that crease of that skin of that muscle on the side there, the digitorum anguli oris as it stretches, buckles into the mouth now coming up to the cheekbone, a little hatching and cross hatching across there to bring that divot out, that uh, hollow space okay, in the nose a little bit. So you're getting some insight of how I kind of work ahead with this tool around the bottom. So I stop a moment, I'll draw quite a bit, then I'll stop I'll look at the entire effect, then I'll go back and I'll draw some more. And I'm also pulled in, so I have no idea as I'm working. I'm working blind. I don't know what's in the back of the going on outside the screen that I'm drawing from. Now I can see the image that I'm working from, but I can't see my actual drawing. I'm just like you in this situation, watching, because I can't really see. So coming down further, we see this overlap. of the cheek and getting that to roll back as the chin comes forward. So I'm trying to find that one line that's going to give me that, that edge. I need that crystal clear edge. Everything can be a little loose because of the side of the shadow, but I need that one defined edge through there as well. That gives me that stronger, darker line gives me that edge. So more hatching more value build up so just working my way through <clears throat> working the chin slight cross hatching working the form around through there looks like I'm about to zoom out now or I thought I was let's see there we go all right so that's working pretty well it's getting another layer of, of uh, clarity with the form you can see the facial forms now converge nicely with the overall head structure and they've gotten more defined as we pulled out 
still, I'm still working with that smaller tip. So soon I'm going to be pulling out. Well, it looks like I go back into the, the mouth a little bit, really deeply now to get some detail. Yeah, you know, I pulled out to see what exactly I had. Now I can pull back in to get a little closer to that. Notice it's it's still kind of painterly. It's still loose. I don't. I can render photo real uh, things, and I teach that here at the university. But most of the time, I like to keep the drawing a little bit looser. But again, that's a stylistic thing, so I'm not gonna. That would take us. It would take us 20 hours to get to a kind of a photo reel, and for for what purpose? And once you get to this point, you'll be able to do that. So I'm digging through a little bit of the highlight in that lip crease as it glossens a little bit wet there, and getting these little striations. Basically, they're dots and dashes, aren't they? It's kind of like a little Morse code of of drawing lip top down below the crease in there, through curved in through. And these little dashes of the glistening highlight and also uh, form where the light starting to touch that, that reddish area. It gets a little bit more flat for his flesh, fleshy, flesh tone, but it's where the light's hitting at about 45. It's just not quite as bright as the nose will be because the nose is really receiving that 45 degree light over. So a little bit more in through there and I can kind of blend. Now I'm drawing with the eraser tool. So I'm taking off uh, quote unquote digitally subtracting and that's a great way to also take a look how I'm creating I'm strengthening my edges through bringing that tight edge against that the edge of some of the lip where I need it now I'm adding additively just coating see how I coat over it just a little bit to darken it if it's too light you can always coat over it through here a little bit of a little bit of erasing too as well So to get some of the kind of symbolic look as we pull back. When I pull back, it'll make hopefully a little bit more sense. But these together create dots and dashes and and almost kind of a more again a Morse code. They do get more symbolic. So when you do go to museums and when you do go to galleries and you see artists you like, whether it's Rembrandt or Caravaggio or Tiepolo or Tintoretto or David Hockney or Lucian Freud or whomever you're looking at, whether it's it's anybody get up close to their paintings get up get up close to a Chuck Close painting look how symbolic and abstract his his work uh, after his earlier black and white period um, and when he's working in color and you can see how abstract it is and you get far away and it, it blends together so I think the mouth is coming together nicely some of the 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 passages work pretty well now finally I'm getting into toning now a uh, bigger st stroking area so I'm going with a pretty wide now mark making tool so I'm opening that up and I'm going to start turning in toning in all this dark and it's going to start to make more sense completely as we work these values together so it's really pretty broad there working a little bit of background background into the foreground of the object I'm going to take it down a little bit even broader, uh, maybe too big, yeah, maybe not. So I'm just basically just touching into the dark. Look at that, and so how big that is. So that's like the big side of a charcoal stick or a graphite stick. Probably better to charcoal. Then I'll take it back a little bit, take it down. It's like using little different different parts of the same stick for effect. Now it starts to come together. Gradually, so gradually get there mostly in these types of techniques, don't we? And come to it uh, not an all in one approach, unless you have a very quick amount of time and then it is what it is. It's a very quick sketch and you realize by the look of it. But here it's a little bit more sustained, about an hour and hour, hour and 45 and 12, 12 seconds to be exact. So we're coming around the head. I'm also trying to, to also feel this rhythm of the strokes. See how I'm turning and stroking the rhythm where it's kind of like almost like a little headgear with a little chin strap for now. But it's moving across these forms. Kind of a gradual glazing of, of tone. A 
moving along with the value. Just being mindful where that muscle form is of the sternocleidomastoid. And you see I kind of I lost the ear, but we'll regain it back. We'll get it back subtractively. Dig through all that material. A little bit finer nib now. Defining a little bit further the top of the head. And the side, around to the cheekbone. That core shadow through the end of the jaw there, middle jaw, where it turns back towards the ear. Look how far down the ear is because, you know, we're way off the standard model because of perspective, so the ear becomes much lower as we're pushing over. Now I'm starting to subtract now. So we're getting into the, the habit and the idea that, okay, let's start to clean this up. And it's real, it's really much, it is a, such a drawing tool now. It's a little incising kind of hatched drawing tool where I can really erase. So I can imagine it could be a white Stadler eraser, a pink pearl, or it could be Japanese mono, however we want to think about it. But I'm really going in and defining edges now further, cutting back in and that, cleaning up this back a little bit, or quite a bit later. Finding out where the end of that neck is a little bit. So it's a combination of both of those processes that make it rich, kind of a rich experience to work with. So now settling in a more defined trapezius area over. That kind of curls over pretty loosely through here. Sternocleidal mastoid underneath there, a little pocket edge that turns into the digastric. So I'm going to stage him now defining and refining taking it from a rough raw area to a block in and getting a little bit more defined with it. <clears throat> Moving downward. At all times I'm trying to control the medium and I'm also saying am I accurate but I'm also as important trying to keep in my mind you know, there's so many things going on that you have to be thinking about at one time what is the overall general structure of all this even if I'm starting to be loose now like I am just for now it'll tighten up in a little bit what is the general structure that block equality where is the front plane the top plane the side plane where's my light source <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, where is all that in relationship to what I'm doing? Am I keeping that goal in mind? So it seems like a lot, but it you know the more you do, you just you get faster at it, and it's not necessarily such a conscious thing where I'm narrating in my mind like I am now. Excuse me, but it is a um, it's something you see and notice, and you and you work and you adjust as you as you draw through the drawing, if you will. Defining that brow. It's a little bushy on that side. <clears throat> Alright, cutting through the ear. Looks like, no. Cut a little bit. I'm going to define that a little bit further in a moment. So that ear is lovely as it pops kind of through. You can see where it doesn't hug the side of the head, but it comes out a little bit at an angle. And so it receives a little light. So if it, if it, if it stayed true to the 90 degree change of the head, 
then it would stay in shadow. That's why most of it's in shadow, and then we have that ear popping out. We get a little bit of light on that. The helix and tragus and anti-tragus area, no, anti-helix, mostly. Some artists will like to keep all this loose mark making. I would if it was a different, different idea, different process, but I want to clean it up. And I show you how I clean it up. There's so many different ways to do this. Keep that in mind. I, I, I have to always say to my students and anybody that will listen to me on YouTube, land, I said, be, you know, just be careful of how to type things. It's more than one way to how to. There's many different ways to cut a piece of paper. You know, you look for things that work for you, or different approaches to the same thing about drawing, and you try them out. But one how to is is too too orthodox or too too definitive I think and so just be careful there curving around defining through the cheekbone adding these cheek structures going back and refining them getting a little bit tighter each pass So I'm feeling the hair out, but I'm keeping it broad. So they're strokes, and they're broad strokes. And I know the hair is grayer, and it's in a little bit of light, too. So I'm keeping it a little bit less um, definitive. And then I start to make some, some marks through there to get the overall feel of the rhythm. Not trying to get everything, I'm trying to get the spirit of it, and I take it back a little bit where it's a little too too light. So I just kind of glaze, it's like glazing over it. And cascading over the, the uh, side plane of the head where all the little brow ridges and wrinkles are. I don't think I get too much of all that detail, which is fine. Later on, it's a little, little too much. So sometimes we subordinate other areas for expression in another. Getting a little bit darker with that opening. Finding around the ear now, around the helix area, and then into the canal and the other areas. Back of the hair to the neck. Finding in through the ear, trying to lift out, I'm lifting out where the light is gently at first to get a broader pattern of the shape of the ear, knowing about the form of the ear, and knowing a lot about it so I can lift out what I need. And then I'm reading what the image is that I'm working from giving me. And varying the nib width to help me out in that process. You can see how this is really starting to come along now. And so it's getting that shape pattern of the ridged highlights of the helix and the anti-helix, which is the inner kind of Y shape at the top of the ear, and the tragus, which is around by the ear canal, and it's still curved right through there. So cleaning up that area further, still pretty raw, but it's starting to emerge and loose. And not only get the shape of it, but also the value and then the edge. What's the edge quality? Where is it sharper? Where is it blurrier or softer? Hard edges versus foot versus soft soft edges. Excuse me. Are very important uh, in this process for for sure. Always. I mean, there's not a drawing that you won't that you won't do that won't won't have that uh, 
that idea of that quality. That just goes, I think, goes without saying. So that's starting to work pretty well. It can be very painterly in that sense. That could be enough to say ear if you wanted to leave it, leave it that way. But we want to go a little further, tightening around. So this this kind of added subtractive process can be a lot like painting, feel a lot like painting the way I'm I'm working through it. <clears throat> Working additively. So you'll see me vacillate between additive and subtractive. Now tightening up some of those edges with the, the ear, ear area. Where I need to. Okay, working down the jaw here, feeling that out. Getting more defined there. So it's a process of bringing it, you know, all together. It's about 30 minutes left in the drawing that I can see here, and the timer that I have on the the production end of this, so I can bring it to a pretty strong conclusion in about 30 more minutes from where it's at now to refine it further. <clears throat> so working around the neck. If you get confused at all, if you get confused about your drawing, Think about what are the basic forms and shapes that I can bring out. Not about minutia of detail, but you know, what's the sternocleidal mastoid muscle, that neck muscle, and that's a kind of a tube. It's starting to bring out that conical kind of tube. And then around the ear with the jaw a little bit, and softening those edges a little bit, filling that in, softening through, turning and softening that edge just a little bit more to make it to make it work for me a little bit better. So what's the simplest expression that I can get to? And the more simple expressions, you keep adding simple expressions, and they start to get medium complex, and they get very complex um, to an ending point that you want within your drawing. So he's starting to emerge now from the void further. Developing in that cheekbone, that pocked area where it gets hollow, where the mandible ends and the buccinator is in that area. That smaller muscle, that cheek muscle. But it can be very hollow where the masseter ends on the mandible, and the mandible is in, a little bit in front of and, and uh, separated from the maxilla, that circular part. If you're not sure about these terms, basically there's a little hollow of the mouth jaw right in through there. So now taking a bigger, bolder approach again. So I vacillate between a bolder approach and minutia when I need to. Starting to just kind of gloss over this. The opacity is only at 22, so it's pretty pretty light. So I can build it up by layering and glazing, glossing over the top of that. You can see that start to come together. Feeling the rhythm around that, feeling the value through the neck area and the shoulder. And that this is a great blunter approach, more blunt when I want to soften edges and change to getting a little now the background tone to start to work for me. Just 
changing into smaller area to now really start to shape the back of the head where that hair is. It's a little fuzzy where the back of his hair meets his trapezius and through there so I can start to really tighten up the silhouette of that a little bit further. I don't need every curl back there but to tighten up. So I kind of blur my vision when I look at that and I look at it as an edge and then I say okay where, where can I tighten that silhouette. Same thing with the muscles in front and also what's going on up here. A little more silhouetting of the hair. So it's like it's like a little surgery. It's like taking out little little, little scissors. <clears throat> and I'll go back to additive. So I pop back and forth pretty good. And it really there's at this point I wouldn't say there's a, there's no rhyme or reason. It might look a little quite frankly to me it looks like a little random. But it, there's a there's a method to the madness. It's just now that I've got everything blocked in, it's just a matter of disciplining it out and staying in areas and tweaking one area and then balancing out to another another area and reading reading the value through that through there. So we get the trapezius muscle and you can see where it breaks up a little bit too. The splenius, that little extra tube where that shadow is. So if you don't know what those muscles are, it's okay. You just you draw them. If you know the forms pretty well, you can make it look pretty good. It's good to know them. Anatomy is important. So check out the anatomy series if you haven't that I have, or somebody's, anybody's that you like. Not everybody knows it. So just bringing out the curvature, the turn of the side of the head where it's darker there. I see all the wrinkles, but I'm not going to draw all them. Sometimes I subordinate all that too as well. Get the general idea of it through here. Defining edges, redefining edges. Also now the stroke and the mark making and the rhythm are starting to come together. It gives you a nice movement from the top of the head through the shadows and it kind of flows down and around through the down to the cheekbone excuse me the um, the lower jaw and the shadow into the neck and out to the shoulder it's kind of a, a rhythmic movement through there so bear with me we've got about 20 25 23 minutes left popping in Going down to a very small, well, nope, a little broader to soften. Okay, yeah, so good technique. Soften up some of the shadow there in the eye. Soften that so it's the opacity is not too high, and the bluntness of the tip is good in that I can soften up edges. If the tip was too small, it would define further. So the more blunt, broad edge you have, the more general the value form. And then the the uh, if you're on the tip, you're really defining. It's like you're you're etching or being incisive. Like you're almost like you're cutting with a knife, depending upon the amount of value that you use. If it's really dark. If it's really dark value, and you have a small tip, then you're like you're drawing. You're definitely contour line drawing. Here I want to stay away from that because you want to be mindful of the softness of edges and the power of edges too as well. So now just taking, hinting at the wrinkles, those ridges, they're just ridged uh, cylinders and they're darker in between and behind because of the light source coming from the top right. Now getting over to the hair getting that little defined further being just gentle with some of the curves. I'm not drawing every one just want to get the the general feeling out of pulling out some of the lighter ones and through there. Some of the broad strokes I made earlier work for me in that they give an overall general value feeling. So this is getting I would say medium to more tight definition in through here. 
softening edges and softening by erasing. So I'm looking at now the shape between the light and the dark there and also its, its edge quality. And working across the form a little bit, swishing it around, moving it downward. So I'm hatching it through. Notice the direction of mark. I want to reflect on the under curvature of that cheekbone, and excuse me, jawbone as it turns down into the neck, and then also relate in the shapes of the shadows as well. So it's kind of under turning there. So I'm adding now a little bit of form or value. And so I'm using the tonality and also the contour line to work into my favor for both of them. Now curving on through, curving around a little bit. Got pretty loose with that mark. It's working pretty well and I pull out See, I'm a little bit wider. I'm okay with that. I'm wide. He's a little bit narrower in the, from the 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 jaw uh, to the end. Of the, yeah, right into that point, but about the side plane of the head where the shadows move to where his jaw is. He's a little bit perceptually more narrow. I'm okay with it. I wouldn't change. If it was really bad, I would I would alter. But I'm a little bit more wide there, and I'm okay with that. You can. There are certain things you can tolerate. the 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 lightness is pretty strong strong, decently strong, so I wouldn't I wouldn't change it and I can still work on my values. But it is just a little wide. And so all this is about refining now. So this this latter part, we've got about a little bit less than twenty minutes left. And it's all about refining to a point where I say that's probably enough to, to carry through for the lesson or for the, for the study. And to show you to show you what it is. <clears throat> a lot of times I'll just take, okay, is that a good point or not? Is that, is that uh, wide enough? I don't have any saved points. And defining in through here, I'm kind of letting that darker line be more definitive of the brow edge and then let that, light, that looser passage be a little bit of that the tone as it fades around the head. Pulling that socket in further, defining that a little bit further. Pulling that around. It gets a little darker because it fades from us. It's turning the form. If you study light on an object, even though it's lit on that side, it still has to turn away from it, so it's not completely the same value brightness as it would maybe in the middle third of it. So it fades away from us too. There. Now this is all fine tuning, you know, fine tuning sketching, working on edges and and underneath. So this is where your eye, if you if you've never gone this far into study before, it's good it's good to watch too, but. This is where you can start to fine tune things and take it to a new level. Now, some artists might blend more, some might scratch more, or more cross hatching. You notice the technique is about a half and half with a blending technique or a broader technique, if you will, and then a, a hatched line on top of it to, for direction too, as well. So you can mix and mix and match. Probably, probably one of the looks you want to stay away from that I see in beginners and especially beginning drawing is the just blend with my finger in graphite look and it, it um, if you're one of those be careful if your drawings aren't growing then you that might be one thing that's holding you back is just anytime you see a smooth edge you just kind of blend with your finger as a matter of fact try to if this is you try to not blend anymore for a good long time let the tools do you the work for you. Let your hand and the tools do your work, do the work for you, rather than your finger, your finger blending tips. 
and then start studying master drawings. Start looking at drawings from the Renaissance through to the French academic period in the 18th and 19th century and see how artists can blend, but they never live, let a blended surface live too long without some some hatching marks to make it live as well. They, they, they understood that that just wasn't a good aesthetic look later on, so I think that's important to uh, notice or, or think about. Now notice I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, interior now, uh, hatching and refining. And for me, I do like that hatch look. Some people are not going to like that, and that's okay too. Forget about the style and look more for form. Here I'm just defining spending my time now working on the form of the face, the chin area, and thinking about each little area and asking myself a quick question in my brain. Is it a cylinder? Is it an egg-like form or a spherical-like form? Or is it a box-like form? What is it really quickly? And then what is its true um, overall shape? Whether it's Because it's not going to fit into one of those three exactly. So. It, the, the reason why we say that is it what's its general shape or, or three-dimensional form and then you 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 play off that you know quite nicely so that's what we're doing here now working with the the, uh, the muscles of the chin it's kind of a boxy little form and it's, <clears throat> excuse me it's darker on this left and bottom edge because of the light sources coming from the top right remember anytime you have a light source direction which you will it, the shadows will be its opposite. So if you have a light source coming from the top right, the shadows will be bottom left, just like we have here. And once you understand that, and you can see that in objects, see it in paintings, and, and realize that in your drawing, you are on your way to, to really understanding about light and movement and shadow and really getting a sense of a purpose of all of it. Uh, together and deeper than than you had before. It's very very logical. It's not random. It's not a mystery. It's a very kind of logical uh, process and processes to define further. So you can see how this gets a lot a lot tighter. Um, and I like to keep that loose structural mark. So look at the difference now from where we're at earlier. How that bottom chin around the jaw starts to get lively and more uh, put together but still kind of a loose um, passage of, of mark making and stroke making as well. I really like the work of Franz, ha Franz Halls, a Dutch painter, Baroque Dutch painter. As much as I like Rembrandt, there's you know debate about who was better. Rembrandt was probably better. He's certainly more famous, but I do enjoy Franz Hall's structural uh, mark making and, it, and for whatever reason it gets into some of my, my academic tutorial type of, of drawing. So I do like that hatched kind of kind of look. So it becomes a conscious thing overall. But most artists of that era, re the Renaissance and the Baroque neoclassical, when they were drawing, they'll, they'll, they'll use a hatched line. Delacroix when he was doing ink drawings, etc. Uh, uh, Michelangelo when he was doing his tonal drawings, he used a very, uh, very precise incise kind of, of line. So I'll challenge you, be a student of, of everything when you're looking at art. Be a student of all the little idiosyncratic mark making processes. All right, developing the eye, the eyelids further. Getting a little bit more defined with some of the edge of the eye, the lid, the, the lid of that, the side plane of the eye, the duct area and also the extra area between the nose and the the eye defining a little further the eyeball the pupil area that little shadow just to get clean it up and get a little bit clearer this will tighten up the eye further when we pull away from it and make it more of the focal point as well so I'm kind of dragging and pulling down on the forms a little bit, getting those lids to turn too as well. A little bit darker through there. They're just nothing more than flaps of cylindrical skin now, teasing over the the eye. 
So if you're still awake, you're still with me, if you're taking your Red Bull and your no dose, um, you're probably really hyper. Uh, <laughs> I hope you're still with me. And you're, if you're listening, watching through, defining further. Hopefully you're getting a, a sense of how this could all, you know, end the end game of all this as they continue on further. So we've got about 10 more merciful minutes, I promise. And you can see how this just gets clearer and cleaner. And uh, let's pull out of it now and see how see how that tightens up nicely. That starts to look um, more fuller. So I'm getting closer to a finish. In through here. So let's, I can't remember, let's see how I leave the background and then I think I'd add some background and then also the the area of the shoulder and neck I probably need some more finish as for a sketch. I'm, I'm intrigued by working digitally. I know other artists are more sophisticated with it for sure. It's not really my game. But I like drawing, making it work just like the uh, the brick and mortar I suppose drawing process are out in the, in the uh, uh, world of not pixels but atoms and molecules and how that look they can 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 I make it look almost the same no other artists make their work look very digital and they do it beautifully lots of concept arts and illustrators I'm not really that that kind of person overall if you are great there's nothing wrong with that go for it so defining the filterman through here further, a little bit more of a divot to give that turning under turn of that that real puckered quality of holding on. Maybe he's got a lemon sour in his mouth. I forget what he had. I think it was a Jolly Rancher's watermelon. And I, and I said, keep that, keep hold on to that, and and let's let's do some photo sessions with that too. That would be a good a good way to use. Use use those ideas for for facial expressions. Like it could be this could be a drawing of of somebody about to spit out water, uh, for whatever reason, or maybe something else. For you know an idea, if they were a boxer. Maybe it was blood. I don't know. I don't want to go too gory, but you get the idea. So that's starting to clean up now. Nice. And I, and I like the the loose quality of the line work, but look at how the, all the lines move in different directions. It's not a random process. It is a a loose sketch or expression of contouring around forms. Um, a tighter process, you can go find. Take a look at any type of money, currency, bills, paper money where there's engraving, especially older ones. Uh, British pounds, American dollars, euros, where there's engraving and how beautiful the engraving is. Engraving was a profession where artists would take their drawings and paintings and take it to an engraver to have them engrave uh, their drawings. Gustave Doré, you should look him up, D-O-R-E, his series of, of Dante's trilogy, The Divine Comedy, he illustrated that. And those drawings, those were done in drawings, and the engraver interpreted his drawings to beautiful, just beautiful effect. I believe, I believe it was an engraver. I don't think, I don't think Gustave Doré was the engraver. That's just, that's a pretty long apprenticeship. But they draw on metal. It's carved into metal. And the point being of all this, this little part here, is the beautiful quality of linear contouring and rhythm. It is, it is just remarkably gorgeous. It's a little tighter and a little more controlled. Here mine's looser and a little sketchy and a little gestural um, for, um, for somebody, probably even in the Baroque period or Renaissance, they would think this is probably too, a little too wild actually because you don't see that until we get to later processes in the 20th, 20th century. They just, they just weren't as, as uh, loose with their passages of line. Maybe Rubens was. Maybe Tintoretto. So almost there. Working with, defining the head further. Facial features of the head. Using value and contour and edges. And three-dimensional thought processes of this cheek hole. Cheek area is a ball. It's a rounded ball. 
just stroking around coming around the form getting into mid-tone shadow because that that cheekbone of the zygomatic arch it's poking out and then because it's making a shadow there that means that there's a hollow there where that space between the zygomatic arch and the maxilla exists go take a look on the skull Finding further through, a little bit of mid-tone shadow. You know, if we were painting in color, that would be a nice vermilion-y, uh, cad reddish area. Now I'm going to take off, hopefully, a little bit of extra brow. Ha! Ah, finally, let's see. Yeah, a little too much. Finally, I realized it. You never know what you're thinking when you go back and narrate. So this video was left for a long time just as a test without any narration, and I've had some comments of like, "I wish you were talking on it." And and uh, since I'm not a filmmaker, I didn't, you know, I, I finally realized well, I can start to dub this when I had a little bit more time, and now it's a good time to do it. And I kill some time in between classes right now in my office, and I thought, okay, it's a good time to just dub this over. There we go. It looks a little better. Is it that brow really is? It's it's just hair, but instead of hair, draw it as if it's just another form like skin on top of the bone, and just get a little darker with the value, and it will look like hair. Moving across. cheek form this feels like a little unfinished area in through here with the jaw so I'm going to go back and give this a pass or two or three or four and just working on through these smaller strokes these could, these could be bigger if another artist wanted to it's fine and moving through there this is where the buccinator is where this it's this hollow in there and then there's the jaw mandible over here is a little bit now raised up, you can see that. Looks like I'm going to go to a bigger nib. Yeah, I could tell. There we go. To get that to start to move for us, soften up that edge a little bit. <clears throat> this is a little mid tone areas are important in areas for defining the form further and gentle way. Now coming back in and taking a look and seeing what we've got left. We've got a couple of minutes left. So it looks like I'm probably going to leave the neck area pretty pretty loose, which is fine. A little bit more painterly down there. So let's see what if I do anything with the background. I forget if I did or not. I'll find out in a moment here. So I'm <laughs> rediscovering it like you are. Looks like a little bit more Added it through here just a little bit. Yeah, so it's a pretty good. I'm almost done. Pretty good. Pretty pretty good place to leave it. It's a good good uh, sketch. So so weaknesses I would say is a little bit wide in the facial structure. Um, I think that's the area where I miss a little bit um, more of the lower eyelid could have been realized before the the. Uh, the uh, eye socket is is drawn underneath there, but I'm I'm pretty happy overall with the with the sketch as a whole. I don't I don't think it takes away from the look any further. But he is a little bit a little bit wider, but I think that's okay. Any more so than I would say I need to needed to go back and, and change that. So you know you always can be you can be a little little bit off, and it, you really really wouldn't be able to tell a lick. That's totally fine. Most of the time we'll you know especially if you're working from images. You want to be more than in the ballpark. You want to nail it, but but um, uh, you can miss areas and still nail it pretty well. So just a few uh, few more passes here. I'm just about done. So it just about wraps it up. So 
Um, again, I hope that gives you one one way of many to to work on, you know, working on head head structure. This is more a digital examination or uh, process, but uh, it is is uh, is still valid and um, I think works pretty well as an example. All right, you guys take care out there. I'll see you soon with another lesson. Keep on drawing. Bye-bye.